Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight for the State of Brexit in 2024 with Peter Foster and Professor Chris Gray. For those who don't know me, I'm Michael Anderson from the EM UK staff team. Before I pass over to our chair, I just have a very quick spot of housekeeping. This is our first members only event of 2024 and we'll see Peter and Chris give a comprehensive sense of where Brexit is at, how it is likely to develop over the course of 2024 and discuss the most important questions facing the campaign to take the UK back to the heart of Europe. We will hear first from Peter and then from Chris, who will be in conversation with Molly for around 10 minutes each before she takes us into the Q&A session, beginning with a few questions of her own using what we call the chair's prerogative. You can ask your questions in the chat from now and we will get to as many as we can in the Q&A session. When typing your question, please say which speaker the question is for. My colleague Scott Daniels and I will be watching the questions and we'll bring them up onto the screen during the Q&A session, which will begin at around 7.20 or 7.25. We will wrap up the webinar at eight o'clock. If you can't put your question in the chat for accessibility reasons, then you can email your question to events at europeanmovement.co.uk and Scott will add them into the system. Please also know that this webinar is being recorded and we are streaming live right now on YouTube. So as always, keep the language clean. Now we have some fantastic speakers tonight, so I will hand over to our chair, Senior Vice Chair of European Movement UK, Molly Scott Cato. Thank you very much, Michael, and thanks to everybody for joining us this evening. I would entirely concur with what Michael just said about the quality of the speakers who are joining us this evening. It's really exciting for the European movement to welcome two of the most expert commentators on Brexit and what I've particularly valued about their work over the past few years is that they've really cut through the ideology and just given us the facts around Brexit which has been lacking and been so important in terms of making decisions about our future. So firstly we've got Peter Foster who is public policy editor of the Financial Times where he writes uh, their weekly Brexit, Britain After Brexit newsletter as well as other pieces of course and he's also the author of a recent book what went wrong with Brexit and what can we do about it? And that we have a, a special discount code for that book. So we hope lots of you are going to buy it after tonight's webinar. It's really great having Peter doing real time impact analysis of what leaving the EU has meant for us. And that's something we would expect our government to do. But unfortunately, with this government, we haven't seen that. Then our second speaker is Professor Chris Gray, who is Emeritus Professor of Organisation Studies in the School of Business and Management at Royal Holloway University. And he was previously professor at both Cambridge and Warwick Universities. He is the author of the blog, I'm sure you follow Brexit and Beyond. And over the weekend, he's been blogging about the scandal of the failures of the settlement scheme for EU citizens. The real life impacts of the failings in that settlement scheme, uh, you know, devastating human impacts. And he's been itemizing those. And we are certainly willing to campaign on those and defending EU citizens who chose to make their lives with us and drawing attention to the problems they face. It's really important. So thank you, Peter. Thank you, Chris, for being with us tonight. Before we, we move on to hear their pearls of wisdom, I'm just going to briefly introduce what the European movement's up to right now and talk a little bit about our step-by-step -step strategy. Now, um, for a lot of us who very much oppose leaving the European Union and are very keen to rejoin, I think we have a question, why can't we rejoin right now? And uh, I think we know there are answers to that question. But the, the reason we have our step-by-step -step approach is so that we feel we're making progress because obviously as the European movement, our ultimate goal is to rejoin the EU, but we don't feel that we can do that immediately. And that's why we see it as a, as a series of steps and more of a journey than something we can do instantly. Having said that, the polling on where British people are at is extremely encouraging. There was a, an article in the FT just before Christmas Although uh, it was by Martin Wolf, and although his conclusion is that we won't be rejoining anytime soon, so not terribly cheering for us, the polling he reported was, I think, incredibly encouraging for, for those of us that think we've made a mistake with Brexit and that it's a mistake we can reverse. So he found that the average of six recent polls shows that 56% of respondents are in favour of rejoining, or perhaps we should say joining the EU. 
and that varied between 60 to, to 49 percent in favour. So a strong majority already think we should be members of the EU. He says there are three decisive reasons for this. First, it would create uh, f three reasons why we shouldn't do this immediately, according to Martin Wolf. There are a lot of uncertainties around it. It would bring back the divisions in British politics and we would be joining a different EU from the one we left. Now, I hope we'll debate those points when we get to the question and answer session and also ask our speakers what they think about the, the, the speed with which we can think about rejoining. And some of you will know that I'm organising a series of visits to EU capitals, which is also part of our campaigning work, just to get an answer to the question, how fast can we do this? What sort of conditions do we need to meet? And what sort of barriers will be in our way as we move back to membership of the EU? So in terms of our step-by-step -step strategy as the European movement, we have a number of steps outlined and I think we all celebrated when we rejoined Horizon and that felt like an important step back towards closer relationship with the EU. You'll know that we're campaigning strongly now on the Erasmus Plus scheme and giving our young people the chance to travel in Europe and to uh, meet other young Europeans not just students, but also those in jobs, an important exchange scheme for European young people. And that's part of our commitment to re restoring the rights that were lost when we lost freedom of movement. And we'll probably talk later about our, our campaign, Face the Music, which is about helping musicians travel as they could before we left the EU and the problems they're facing because of restrictions on travel. So... The four steps that we, we talk about when we talk about step by step back to the EU, the first one is to change the Brexit deal in the sort of ways I'm talking about now with Erasmus and, and free movement, but also phytosanitary and sanitary deals, the sort of vet deal that, that Labour talk about. All those deals that mean we're aligned with EU law better so we don't face the sort of barriers for people moving, for goods moving that we're facing at the moment. The second one is improving employment access, improving access to markets for employment and for goods. Uh, we all know that we didn't really get a very good deal in terms of services or financial services, and that's creating a lot of problems for um, an entry to markets for, for some of the goods that we don't think about as often and, and also for services. So that's our second step. And then our third step is about a renewed political vision for the UK's role in Europe and in the EU. I think we've seen with what's happening in Gaza and what's happening in Ukraine, how the, the UK just doesn't really have a very strong foreign policy position at the moment. We seem to be sort of drifting aimlessly in the mid-Atlantic. And there are all sorts of ways in which we need to rebuild our relationship with other European countries and with the EU itself. And that's, you know, on important foreign policy and geopolitical issues. And some of you will have attended and heard Peter Ricketts' very interesting thoughts about how that might develop but also on crucial issues like climate change. You know, we need to rebuild that relationship and restore the vision of working with Europe to deal with those important issues. And lastly, our fourth step is establishing the credibility and influence that will be required for us to, to rejoin the EU and to build a successful campaign to, to, to become members again in the future. And so obviously that's something more internally focused and I hope I will encourage the, the speakers to, to give us some advice if they have any on that as we move through the webinar. But first, first of all, I'm going to introduce the first of our speakers and, and raise some questions with him so he can share some of the expertise he's been sharing through his articles in the Financial Times. And so um, perhaps you can bring Peter up onto the screen as well, Scott, and we'll move on to addressing him. Hello, Peter. Thank you for being with us. Good evening. So nice to my be first question. Yeah, my first question to you is a pretty open ended one. And I know you have lots of interesting things to say. And so the question is, what's really happening with UK trade since Brexit and why? Well, the, I think the first thing to say about what's happening with UK trade and Brexit is that all the trade stats are um, full of noise and mud as a result of the pandemic, which completely scrambled global uh, uh, supply chains uh, and also the, the way the ONS uh, collates and uses those statistics. They've changed the way that they do it, and that has made comparisons very difficult. Um, so uh, uh, what were the kind of headline numbers? I'd say good trade have been has been much uh, uh, more uh, uh, impacted than services trade. 
which has proved relatively resilient. Um, that's partly, I think, because we have a big comparative competitive advantage in services, and also because the pandemic um, greatly uh, increased the use of digital media um, for delivering services um, via a, a Zoom and, you know, there's less travel. So that's to some way protected services. Nonetheless, I think it's interesting that given the UK's comparative advantages in services, um, we have, if you look at the Resolution Foundation uh, data, performed not badly, but uh, I think it's fair to say not as well as you would have expected had Brexit uh, not happened. Uh, on the good side, I think it's a much more pronounced, uh, um, uh, uh, clear impact of um, uh, uh, on UK goods trade. And that's not surprising when you uh, elect erect barriers to the market takes half your uh, trade. Uh, and you look at the integration of uh, uh, UK businesses into EU supply chains. Most UK manufacturing is not end-to-end -end manufacturing, it's making bits that go into bits. And so there's lots of ways you can measure that, but I think one of the one of the interesting ways is to look at the counterfactual measures, the doppelganger that people like uh, uh, John Springford have created. And what you see is um, UK goods trade down about 13% on what otherwise would have been, even if you don't use a doppelganger, once you strip out inflation, so that's values, which the government always uses, and you look at volumes, you see in quite a lot of areas, um, UK volumes, food and drink, etc., chemicals, not recovering from 2019 levels. I would say a couple of other indicators. Trade intensity is one of the measures that academic economists, which is not what I am, I'm a reporter, not an academic economist, use, which is GD, which is the uh, um, imports and exports as a proportion of GDP, what you see is that UK trade intensity, with one little blip at the back end of last year, 2022, um, so now that back end of 2022, not, now not 2023, what you see is UK trade intensity, that's a measure of the proportion of UK economy that is done with, that is produced by trade, import and export, um, is really bumbling along the bottom of the G7. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is if you look uh, at all of the business surveys, British Chambers of Commerce, Make UK, the Manufacturers Group, what you see is really almost no improvement in the proportion of companies who say they are getting used to trading with the EU. That's because the levels of frictions haven't changed. And I think actually one of the things that's deeply underestimated in the Brexit conversation is the impact of future frictions. Brexit is not a one-off. Get used to the customs mm -hmm. forms. Get used to the export health certificates. It all goes away. Actually, there's loads of things coming down the tracks. Carbon border taxes, plastic packaging regulations, supply chain due diligence that are going to increase friction on UK traders with the um, between uh, GB and EU. And I guess the last piece of the puzzle is some interesting stuff that I <clears throat> was highlighting in my newsletter last week from Boston Consulting Group, uh, which modelled forward trade expectations, uh, and Stephen Hunsaker's trade tracker uh, uh, at the UK in a changing Europe. And what you see is actually the last available quarter, Q3 23, UK trade uh, was 53% with the European Union. That's actually gone up since Brexit. So you might think yabba dabba do. that's because we're having a trade bonanza against all the odds with Europe. But it's not. What it actually reflects is that our trade with the rest of the world is absolutely, as we expected, not compensating for the impact with Europe. But actually, it means that our trade with Europe as a proportion of total trade, which is flat or shrinking, is going up. So we've actually find ourselves more exposed to the market where we've erected all these barriers. And when you look at r local shoring, you know, the, the, the global trends in trade, the decoupling between uh, US and China, what you see actually is that the UK has erected barriers to its neighborhood market just at the point in the global trade cycle when actually regional trade is going to become more and more important. If you go back the last thing I'd say, if you go back to Boris Johnson's famous Greenwich speech, he did actually tacitly, quietly acknowledge that we were, you know, going it alone. Buccaneering Britain was putting to sea just at the moment when 
actually the global gains that came from the liberalization of trade in the 80s and 90s were actually coming to a halt. And um, I think that is going to be a challenge for the UK going forward because, you know, to your points earlier, even if we're going to join the, rejoin the EU, it ain't going to be any time soon. And so we are going to have to deal with the fact that um, trade is going to come more intense and intensive regionally just at the time when we've erected all those barriers to trade, which, of course, David Frost didn't believe in. Thank you so much. That was a yeah, very, very helpful answer. My, my next question is sort of, I feel like this is a bit like an exam, actually, the way these questions are structured. But maybe I could ask you to talk a little bit about um, movements in uh, currency values, perhaps related to trade, but also related to my next question, which is what is really happening with UK investment and why? So I think the UK investment picture is interesting. If you look, you have to distinguish between stock and flows of investment. And again, the picture is very lumpy. So if you look at recent flows of UK investment and then you strip out um, a whole series of wind farm investments that were driven by um, uh, uh, the contracts for difference that attracted a lot of green investment in UK wind farm. What you see is that the flow of investment into the UK uh, has been uh, uh, very impacted by Brexit. Richard Harrington, Lord Harrington, who just did a review uh, uh, commissioned by the government that came out during the autumn statement. Um, it's worth reading that review. It speaks to the challenges that the UK is having in attracting investment. And actually, part of that is um, Brexit barriers, you know, the barriers to trade. So you no longer set up your business in the UK as an entrepot into Europe, which, of course, a lot of Japanese businesses did. Um, and the second big question, I think, is this question of regulatory uncertainty. So one of the things that's, I think, underestimated about Brexit is that it poses a continual and constant question about the way that the UK is going to interact with EU regulation, not just the old regulation, but regulation going forward. AI, uh, um, uh, data, carbon taxes, uh, plastic packaging, etc., and so when we remember the EU, that regulation, often bemoaned by business, came down the tracks uh, from Europe and was enacted into UK law. And so you could horizon scan very easily and you could prepare your business, uh, even though you might not like the regulations. For example, the chemical industry bitterly opposed the EU reach regulations. But once they would conformed to them, it gave them access to this uh, enormous market of 500 million people as then was. And I think the difficult one of the, the, the uncertainty in the policy environment, um, both caused by the gap in regulation between the UK and, and the EU, but also the wider political environment. So the Liz Trust debacle, um, Rishi Sunak suddenly recently cancelling HS2, important for investment, you know, to know what the transport links are, removing the goalposts on uh, um, electric vehicles, for example, those kind of policy shifts, which are to some degree a function of the political uncertainty created by Brexit. Rishi Sunak trying to manage wings of the Tory party um, as a result of Brexit. When you add all that together, you create a very uncertain policy environment and that makes investment uh, difficult uh, to come by. And that's why the government commissioned the Harrington Review. That's why, to be fair to the government, they've got um, Dominic Johnson uh, uh, out there um, trying to use things like the free ports and the investment zones to create what they call place-based clusters to attract investment. Uh, and, you know, they're up against, of course, the subsidies that are coming down the tracks on the EU and from the Inflation Reduction Act in the US. So we see huge green subsidies uh, uh, being handed out to electric vehicle plants and battery makers in the EU, uh, huge subsidies, uh, 490 billion US dollars, uh, uh, just a pure subsidies coming down from the inflation reduction at the US. And so whilst those uh, uh, those moves with the free ports and the investment zones are, are good, whilst the Harrington Review is good, the UK finds itself fundamentally piggy in the middle um, uh, uh, between uh, the EU and the US. And it's not really clear what the strategy is to deal with that. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm going to come back to the Inflation Reduction Act if I get a chance to ask my questions later on. Um, so 
you know, th these are sort of issues that academic economists and commentators and policymakers are interested in. But what about the impact that Brexit's actually had on households and individuals? I mean, has it impacted the cost of living crisis? It has. It's made things more expensive. I forget. I need my numbers. But there's LSE research that shows that Brexit has had impacts on food price inflation. Um, uh, Brexit has made it harder to um, get things from the EU. It's made it harder to get parts for your car. If you take your car to the mechanic, um, it takes much longer to get that new bearing or that new door, etc. I would say from a kind of political perspective, and, I, and I, Chris will have views on this, because neither political party wants to talk about Brexit, really, um, you don't have a situation which in another world you think that you might have where, you know, the Tories vote for Brexit. We have a get Brexit done election. Johnson and Frost do their Brexit deal. And you might expect the last three or four years to have been the Labour Party pointing at how Brexit has damaged the economy. It's made food more expensive. It's made it harder to get things from Europe. It's made it harder to trade with Europe. It's made it harder to get investment in the car industry. Yabu sucks. Look at what the Tory Brexit's done. Of course, that's not what's happened. And no one lives in the counterfactual world. You know, you don't look over the fence and see your neighbour living in non-Brexit land, having cheaper food and easier access to, you know, getting their car service or whatever it might be. So I think that's why whilst people and the polls would, would show this, have a sense that um, Brexit has made the cost of living crisis worse. It's made staffing the NHS harder. It's made um, the economy overall smaller. Um, you know, there's an opinion poll in The Observer just in New Year showing all those things. I'm not sure that Brexit is really the kind of emotional thing that a lot of people are sat in the pub moaning about. Um, those people who understand it and follow it, it exercises them greatly. Those people, you know, manufacturers fighting the pa paperwork, etc. People who read my um, newsletter, etc., have skin in the game in that way, who see very clearly what's going on. They are animated about it. But I think there has been a kind of, you know, political bongella applied to to the to the Brexit thing. And I think that, you know, for a campaigning organisation like yourselves, actually is a is a material consideration because it is it is the slow boiling of the frog you know it's yeah. not um you know it, it, it's a glacier not a volcano and it's volcanoes that um you know attract the attention the molten lava and we've had a flipping pandemic the biggest in 100 years had an inflation crisis we got war in europe again in ukraine when you set against all those things the slow burn costs of brexit i don't think land in the way that they might have done in a world where those two three big things hadn't occurred yeah thanks obviously we, we are very focused on that and it is our job to to point that out and make that accessible to to people who are concerned about the cost of living crisis and feeding their children but i think what you see in the polling is people are making their minds up in a very determined way and in one direction so even though they're not thinking about it on a daily basis i think a lot of the the messages that you're giving are are changing minds actually anyway there's plenty of scope for questions in the q a so please do drop your questions in the box and we'll we'll come to them in a bit but first of all i'm moving on to our second speaker now who is chris gray and um chris my first question to you it's Thanks. also a bit of an exam question but hopefully you can use it to talk a little bit about about regulation and you know the possibility of divergence because the question is was the Windsor framework really such a breakthrough right um hello by the way thanks for uh, thanks for uh, inviting me um well look I think I mean in a way it depends what what we think the Windsor framework was for what how we answer that but I mean I mean the first thing I think which 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 was important and 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 and, and in a sense of breakthrough about it is that it did do you know really quite a substantial amount to sort of de-escalate or detoxify relationships between the UK and the EU and I mean it's not that long ago but it's you know it's it's perhaps you know easy to forget you know quite quite how how bad relations had become and how much worse they would have become had the Northern Ireland Protocol bill being passed which is which was the 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 the, the, you know, the threat uh, uh, prior to 
um, that. Um, and so at that sort of political level, I think it was it was a, a it, it marked a certain kind of moment um, in, in UK EU relations. And I also think in some ways in terms of domestic politics, certainly at the, at the time and even to an extent since, it did seem like the moment when it was most transparently clear that the kind of the the the, the power of the uh, of the ERG within the Tory party you know just was not what it had been during the sort of long years of 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 of, of, of Brexit struggle and a sense that you know for all the kind of the huffing and puffing and 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 and, and the the rebellion that there was going to be that in fact that didn't actually transpire now you know, you, you, you can sort of overstate that because I think that in some ways you've seen um, a certain kind of regrouping of those kinds of tours. You've seen it in relation to Rwanda. Uh, you've seen it in the way that, you know, once again, the the star chamber has been wheeled out with, you know, Bill Cash at the helm. And you, you were seeing, you know, so 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 this, this has not completely kind of gone away. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it was a kind of, one of the few moments, really, in a way, in which you could sort of see contemporary uh, Tory prime ministers as having kind of laid down the gauntlet a little bit to the ERG and and found that 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 the ERG were not worth they were not able to able to pick it up. Now, I mean, having said that, what has never gone away amongst those that 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 group of not just the ERG, but you know the kind of people I tend to call the kind of the Brexit ultras, the most sort of extreme or most committed Brexiteers. What has has never gone away, and and I have to say this is this is part, I think, of what is significant to the conversation. Perhaps we're going to have later about um, about issues about sort of rejoining and so on. What's never gone away is this persistent myth amongst the Brexiters, not just that when the Windsor framework, but that the the entirety of the Northern Ireland Protocol was in some way sort of unnecessary, was confected uh, by Brussels, or was confected by Dublin or was confected by uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, remain, the, the, the remain of establishment at home. And that, despite the fact that they didn't, weren't able to mount a vote to oppose the Windsor framework, that sentiment has, 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 has not gone away and is as sort of strong as, as ever. Um, so there's, there's, there's those sort of political relationships. And then, of course, the third political aspect is the whole question about how you know how how has it played out in terms of Northern Ireland politics? Now, um, you know, the Northern Ireland Assembly is still not uh, is, is is still not sitting, and to the extent that, I mean, I I felt that the British government should never have even accepted the notion that there was a linkage between the Windsor framework uh, and 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 getting the Assembly up and running again, um, uh, but they did accept. That, that 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 linkage as being sort of you know part of what the Windsor framework would deliver, um, and of course that hasn't happened, and it hasn't happened because just as much as for the uh, ERG type Brexiters, that the DUP, you know, let alone if you like the more sort of you know the, the even more hardline people, sort of you know um, uh, the TUV um, uh, traditionalist union unionist voice people. Um, that they, do, I mean, the winds of the Windsor framework is, or, or any amendments to the Windsor framework, are, are never going to satisfy those people because fundamentally they regard, and they, in fact they're correct to regard, uh, the, the Irish seaboard as being an affront to unionism, um, and so we can't. So, 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 so the Windsor framework hasn't resolved that, and in and of itself, even though there is still ongoing negotiations that I think even today Jeffrey Donaldson has been po commenting quite positively on negotiations with, uh, with, with, with the UK government and his meetings with Chris Heath and Harris, the Northern Ireland Secretary. But um, this really doesn't mean anything because, because, because there's no sign at, at, at that I can see that the EU have any interest in, in, in revisiting the Windsor framework. And so then to come to the fourth leg, which is the non-political leg of this, would be the question of, well, is it working at an operational level? And I think you can say, um, you know, I mean, the, the devil is always going to be in the detail on those things. And of course, it isn't a one-off implementation. I mean, there's going to, there's at least a two-year process to, to to get to full implementation of the Windsor framework. 
But, um, you know, certainly these kind of early stages in terms of the introductions of the, you know, in some ways the crucial part of the mechanism, the red and green lanes, um, you know, that does seem to be working. It has had one very interesting and bizarre side effect, which people who read my blog will have read, read about recently, which is the way that it has led to the creation of this labeling on certain kinds of foodstuffs saying not, uh, you know, not for sale in the EU. Um, now that is to do with the Windsor framework to the extent that it is a requirement for goods of that sort that are going from Great Britain into Northern Ireland to prevent them going into the European single market. But as a basically as a sop to, uh, to, 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 to unionists, the British government decided to make that a requirement for, for the United Kingdom as a whole. So now you've got people, particularly, uh, particularly sort of anti-Brexit people, isn't it? You know, looking at these levels and saying, oh, well, this proves that this food is substandard and, and doesn't meet European standards, which actually is not, is, is, is not what it means. And it's a long, complicated story why it doesn't. But it's interesting to see how, 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 how that, which is something which is directly visible to consumers, is a kind of an unintended consequence coming out of the Windsor framework. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I must admit, my most enjoyable moment for the Windsor framework was when Rishi Sunak told us all how Northern Ireland now has the best of both worlds, yeah. with no apparent irony. Um, Although so he wasn't the first to say that, by the way. I mean, Michael Gove had said that, you know, way back. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's sort of bare-faced sometimes, isn't it? Um, so, obviously, this uh, the Windsor framework relates to regulation and changes in regulation as a result of leaving the single market and leaving the EU. And one aspect of that whole process, which we campaigned on very strongly, was around the retained law bill, which was obviously mm. such an enormous risk to all sorts mm. of standards and protections in this country. And I think amongst other organisations, we can celebrate the, the changes that were made to that. So how do you see that? Do you think um, the changes that were made anyway and the, the massive reduction in the scope of the re retained law bill can be seen as a, as a success for campaigners like ourselves? I think it was a success and it shows that concerted lobbying, you know, obviously, you know, including by, by European movement uh, and concerted lobbying by, you know, by business groups, which we could have a whole long discussion about that in relation to the whole Brexit story. But, you know, it, it, in some ways it shows that it has sort of, um, that it did sort of galvanise a, a concerted and a kind of successful campaign uh, of lobbying. And I think also in the same way as with the Windsor framework, it showed, you know, that some of the kind of the power or the fire or the ire or something of the of the sort of Tory Brexiters has, you know, has somewhat been marginalised because, again, you know, don't forget that you know, this was politically a significant defeat for them. Um, and I think that, you know, there was an interesting remark that was made by sort of Kami Badenoch at one point in this where she said, you know, when she was sort of... Um, you know, challenged by some of the sort of more ERG kind of people, and she said something like, "I'm a conservative, not an arsonist," um, and that's quite an interesting. <laughs> well, we could wonder about that distinction, but 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 but, it, but, it, but it, I mean, I think it's an interesting one in in terms of it kind of goes to the heart of the you know ongoing and really sort of massive split within the Tory Party that Brexit has 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 to some extent kind of created. Uh, around this thing of well, what does it mean to be a conservative in particular in relation to business, you know, and the the the, the you know the, the well known sort of Boris Johnson kind of you know fuck business line, and this this idea that you know that Brexit was so important and that and that purism of Brexit was something that you had to do with this kind of jack sort of the, 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 the fervor of sort of Jacobins, so anarchistic in that sense, not the Jacobins were anarchists, but you know, that sort of idea of that sort of purity as against the idea of, well, being conservative in, I suppose, the meaning of something which is more, uh, more stable, more responsible or something like that. And so it had that political significance, but, you know, the, 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 there are really kind of significant um, limits to what it means to retain EU law. And this also goes to the heart of what future policy is going to be, because that, in a sense, you know, that is precisely a retention. The crucial issue, and, it, you know, and, and, and Peter Foster alluded to it in what, in what he said, is the issue of the, the, the passive diversions remain. So just having all this stuff uh, still... Uh, uh, still, you know, effectively, you know, retained on, on on the statute book, doesn't do anything to 
the passive divergence, which is and will continue to go on all you know uh, more and more and more uh, as 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 time goes on, um, and of course that places an enormous kind of stress on. And again, the, Peter Foster's columns have been really great in terms of um, detailing this. It, it, it puts enormous stress on firms, individual firms or trade associations to keep on top of what is happening with that. Um, it also, by the way, has a significant implication in terms of what we were just talking about, the Windsor framework, because, of course, it's because whilst Great Britain can passively diverge and will passively diverge, Northern Ireland, in relation to goods, of course, it's a different matter for other things, but in relation to goods, you know, uh, 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 it cannot diverge. And so the more you get passive divergence of, of GB from EU regulation, the thicker that Irish sea border uh, becomes, the border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, uh, and, you know, one side of this, as I say, is, is the impact on firms and, and what trade associations have to pick up. But then there's also uh, the issue of, you know, does the government itself have the bandwidth to actually keep on on top of this stuff and anyway what would it mean to keep on top of this stuff because what it, the implication of that will be to say well that you are going to actually dynamically align not just retain but dynamically align with eu regulation um and you know uh, that clearly isn't tory policy and in terms of what they have said they, uh, what they formally said you know labor have, uh, sort of on the one hand, sort of saying, oh, no, well, we're not interested in dynamic alignment. But on the other hand, they're saying, oh, well, but we don't want to diverge. Well, ultimately, those two propositions in the face of passive diversion don't make sense. So, yes, the retained EU law thing is, you know, certainly an awful lot better than the chaos of not having done that. But it is only it, 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 it doesn't it doesn't stop there. That doesn't enough to deal with any of these things. Thanks, Chris. That's really helpful. Um, yeah, we're the sort of people here who never had enough of experts. And uh, I think you've both shown how useful it is to have expert knowledge. And we really appreciate you sharing it with us. So now we're going to move into a slightly different part of the meeting where we start to ask you for your advice about what we're doing as a campaigning organisation. And this is sort of a movement towards the Q&A session, but I get the first two questions as vice chair of the European movement, seeing what you can offer to help us in our in our mission. And um, the first one is, is asking for your reflections on something that John Curtis told us at our AGM, which I found really useful. And he had some polling and he'd looked at the three uh, main issues which he thought had determined the vote for Brexit. One is the economy, one is migration, and the third one is some element, something about control, governance, sovereignty, and so on, more amorphous really. And what he found in his polling is that people have accepted that there's economic damage and they've kind of factored that in now. And they'd seem, I think, surprisingly unconcerned that actually migration has increased rather than decreased after we left the European Union. And he said that the nub of this now, people changing their mind and us persuading um, enough people in the country to, to, that, that we should rejoin, is all about this issue of control. So um, I wondered what you thought about that and also what you thought about my early remarks about how how fast we can start talking about rejoin and actually when you think it might be possible for us to start negotiations. Shall I put that to Peter first? Well there's, lot, there's lots there Molly. I, I think um, I always defer to the great Professor Curtis because he is the he is the guru of gurus. I I, I refer actually to some focus grouping that uh, the Tony Blair Institute did. And I think what you see is people, whether they voted leave or remain, do value control. Free movement was a very problematic concept for large numbers of people, including lots of people who voted remain. Now, you can argue that was because of the way it was portrayed and the way it was politicised by the government. But... It remains the case that people feel the government, when you ask them, should be able to control borders. Obviously, free movement's a two-way street, etc. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, at the same time, post-Brexit, people have realised that 
you know, there are different types of migration, the small boats, the illegal migration, the migration we need to keep the NHS going. And actually outside a Tory cohort, people are prepared to be open minded about different types of immigration. And so if you go back to those word clouds at the Brexit referendums, you remember for leavers, immigration was this big word yeah. in the middle. It's much more diffuse now. And actually, um, what you find is it's become a wedge issue inside the Tory party. So actually, Labour, Labour, Labour or Brexit, non-Brexit voters, their attitudes to immigration actually kind of tracked each other until about a year and a half ago. And then they diverged because the Tory party, Rwanda, small boats, made it a massive issue within their own vote bloc. And so I think there are two takeaways there. One is any return to the EU is going to require re-embracing free movement. And I think you shouldn't underestimate how problematic that will be. I'm not saying it's a case that can't be made, but I am saying you shouldn't. I don't buy some of the analysis that, oh, people have got over free movement and, and they want it back now. I don't think that the data, the polling shows that. And and the second um, takeaway, however, on the positive side, is that I think once you've got through, if the polls are correct, this particular Brexit government with all its baggage attached to a particular hard version of sovereignty above all else Brexit, I do think that a Labour Party that's prepared to show leadership on the issue can open a wider conversation. Uh, on migration and it will need to do so if it wants to move us uh, closer back close to the eu yeah thanks i'll come back to some of those points in my next question but let me just um ask you what you think about chris perhaps yeah. particularly on the issue of, of sovereignty and what that really meant and how we might address that question in terms of changing people's minds about whether we did lose control when we were part of the eu um the, uh, I, 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 there are lots of things I'd like to say, but one particular thing on that which is kind of interesting is if you cast your mind back to the very first Brexit white paper that was published after, um, uh, just after the Lancaster House speech, so early in 2017, and in the opening preamble to it, and, and David Davis was the Brexit Secretary at the time, it said, um, it said, Britain never lost its sovereignty as an EU country, as a member of the as a member of the EU, but it sometimes felt as if we did. Okay, and it's a very interesting kind of formulation that we sometimes felt as if it did. So, 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 so and to me that kind of says that we're not here in 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 the realm. You know, the idea that the Brexit referendum was some kind of um, some kind of uh, political un university political theory. Uh, seminar on theories of sovereignty from you know from burke to hobbes to plato or something like that you know this is just nonsense kind of thing so it is about uh, i think it is much more about uh, uh, narratives of what can be controlled and, and, and what can't but but i want to pick up a few things the, the opinion polls thing i think that um i think i think that i think that you know i'm speaking as an analyst i would say not as a campaigner um, that I think the campaigners can very easily get too carried away with opinion polls and, and, and what they mean. Um, and there's a number of aspects to that. But one is, you know, is to go around quoting all the time these kind of headline, oh, 6139. Well, straight away, you stripped out the don't knows and the wouldn't votes, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so, 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 so maybe that's so, okay as a kind of campaigning thing in some for a message of a look, you know, our cause is, our cause is popular. But, you know, if there's a fundamental, flaw that lies at the heart of Brexit is that it was founded on a whole series of lies. And if you want to campaign effectively uh, and in a way that will ultimately give a sustainable future membership uh, of, of Britain in the EU, then it cannot be based on, on lies. So let's not kid ourselves about what those polls mean. Let's not kid ourselves about um, how strong is that feeling, right? 
of those of those people who now say that they, they would want to rejoin how strong is that actual feeling to what extent is it bound up with their ge the general unpopularity of the tory government and so brexit's the flagship policy of the tory government and so there's a, a, a spillover uh, uh, into that because for 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 rejoining to be sustainable there has to be a long-term sustainable genuine durable desire amongst the british population and the polity to be a member of the eu it can't just be a matter of of oh a few polls say this for a few years you know you can find polls with as much support for eu membership going back a few months before the referendum so it's got to be embedded and the other thing is which which actually you, Molly, in, in, in speak, when you were talking at the beginning, and you said this almost in passing, and lots of people do, is, uh, oh, well, what about the case for rejoining, or should, or should I say joining, you know? And lots of people kind of say that, but then fall back into just talking about rejoining. And it seems to me that if the EU movement to rejoin, <laughs> to rejoin the EU is serious, it has got to stop ever talking about rejoining. It has got to be talking about joining because it has to be a forward looking proposition, partly for campaigning reasons, because looking forward, because, you know, you, it's what you want to do in the future. But also because it goes back to the point about honesty, that this is that, 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 that Britain is different and will be certainly will be different by the time this would happen, that the European Union will be different and is already different. Um, uh, and that, of course, the um, you know the, the whole sort of wider world of again, you know, Peter touched on elements of it of this wider world of sort of perhaps of deglobalization, of supply chain shortening, um, of what may happen if there's a Trump presidency, all of these kinds of things. So it has to be a forward-looking kind of thing, and 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 also because of the fact that 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 that. that, that, that and I think the, the, the first step in this, from the country's point of view, is a sort of a normalisation of relationships between the UK and the EU, by which I mean not constantly seeing everything through the now dead question of Brexit, of always, you know, as it, as it were, kind of you're know, harking back to 2016 and to that, because as if the, as if the, as if that were the thing. And so, you know, one thing amongst kind of remainers and, and rejoiners and join us if, if I will, will, will call them that is you know all of this stuff about oh it was only an advisory referendum oh only this percentage of the population voted oh what about Russian interference oh what about this what about that at some point I understand all, all that fury and anger about that because I felt a lot of it as well and still do but if you're serious about campaigning you can't just keep moaning on and on and on about the past it's got to be a forward-looking kind of uh, offer um, and there's other things I would say about that. As well, but, uh, anyway, that's my. Yeah, I, I, I would. I, I would. Yes, I would. Uh, so one of the arguments I make in my book is that you have. We join the EU for economic reasons, essentially, right? As a sick man of Europe, we didn't leave by accident. We left because we spent forty years either getting opt outs or carve outs, right? You know, we never were part of the coal meter on bargain, right? We never were. We never saw it as a peace project. We never saw. The, the the upsides of unification because our experience of the war is different etc etc et i think there may emerge a world with a trump two presidency with um you know an increasingly hegemonic china with um you know the race to net zero the impacts of climate change where you can make a real strong case for being part of the neighborhood i don't know whether that means we join, you know, joining the euro, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and whether the British public would ever buy that. But there is a really strong case, and this is a case I think Starmer has to make fundamentally for being part of the neighbourhood from a strategic security, um, climate change, investment point of view. You know, this idea that we become stronger by Europe being weaker is entirely back to front, and it's one of the things that the Brexiteers always get get wrong. You know, they point at Europe. And rightly point out that there are lots of real challenges in Europe at the moment. Um, that doesn't mean that we're better off outside Europe, actually. Mm. You know, weak Europe is bad for the UK. And the framing of this has to be about what's good for the UK. What's good for it's not it can't be a love affair with Europe. I don't I don't believe you'll ever sell that to the British public. But I do think having left 
having found ourselves piggy in the middle, having found ourselves with flat productivity, flat growth, falling living standards. This is the first parliament, the Resolution Foundation says, since, since living memory, where living standards have fallen. And it seems to me that's the way to start to make the pragmatic case for getting back in the neighborhood. Yeah. One of the one of the one of the few sort of slogans of the Brexiters that I agree with was they said, we're leaving the European Union, we're not leaving Europe. So then the question is, you know, given that that ineluctable fact, the question then becomes, what is the relationship? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And I, I agree with you that after this election that's coming, can't come too soon in my view. Um, you know, those questions are all going to change. And we are pretty much agreed with you, Chris, about the use of join rather than rejoin, but at the risk of alienating two people, one of whom has a book with Brexit in the title and the other one has a blog with Brexit in the title, I'm going to risk saying perhaps we shouldn't be using the word Brexit anymore, but anyway. No, but I, and I do, I, I, I kind of agree with that as well, but yeah, I did rename the Brexit, the Brexit blog Brexit and Beyond. Brexit and Beyond, <laughs> okay. We can well, so, so, so I, I, I actually, you know, I agree with that, funnily enough, but it's interesting. I do lots of talks about my book recently, and it's interesting to me how quickly the discussion can get tribal. You know, even in areas where you, you know, people get back to their barricades where they stop engaging on the detail or on the substance. It's just, I wanted to leave. Can't you understand that? I just wanted to leave. I don't give a monkeys about the single market and all that nonsense about c bands or what. I just wanted to leave. It was a question of my gut. You get quite quickly back to that. And the reason Brexit prevails as a label is that it has power. So truthfully, you know, articles that appear in the FT that look at what Brexit has done, you could call it life outside the single market, you know, life outside, life on the periphery, what do you want to call it? But the Brexit label just carries with it a load of salience that get people to engage. And it's mm. it's very difficult to get past it, I think. Even though I write about, not about Brexit, not about leaving, not even about rejoining, often to people's fury, I just write about the challenges of being a relatively small economy on the doorstep of a regulatory Bournemouth. Yeah, yeah. That's why I say thank you for, for keeping us grounded in reality. It's so important and actually surprisingly rare at the moment. Um, now, I'm not being a very good chair because I'm not letting our audience come in and have their say. So I'm going to rectify that now. And we're going to move to the, the part of the evening that's about audience questions. So hopefully behind the scenes, Michael or Scott have uh, got some questions they're going to put on the screen and I'm going to be asked. I'm going to be able to ask on behalf of the audience. Hurrah! Here's the first question. So this question comes from Ian Pounder, and the question is: How has Brexit impacted UK taxation? Is it a contributory factor in the current record level of taxation? I th maybe we'll go to, to Peter first with that one. I think to the extent that um, Brexit has proved uh, a headwind to investment growth. I mean, the truth is the UK's productivity crisis begins after the great financial crisis of 2008. And what you have at the moment is essentially stagnant economy and both main political parties not prepared to put up taxation, headline taxation. And so the result of that is the stealth tax rises by freezing the threshold. So you get what's called fiscal drag, more and more people sucked into higher and higher tax brackets. And then I think what you're going to see is the government finding ways to make you pay more for things that used to be covered by taxation um, uh, out of your own pocket. So NHS waiting lists will become so long you'll just go private, as indeed more and more people are. Utility companies, utility bills will go up because ultimately utility companies may, may have to start offering, offering social charges or doing windfall taxes or fixing potholes. I think in a whole range of areas, you're going to start to see um, government finding ways to make you pay more. Now, Brexit has had a contribution, in my view, to the UK's, um, you know, has not grown as fast as it otherwise would have done. And that ultimately puts pressure on the exchequer and then ultimately sees taxes go up. But, you know, drawing the causal link, I think, is probably 
quite difficult. Yeah, just quickly add to that that um, I, I can't quite remember the details now, but it, I seem to recall that Ian Mulhern at the um, Tony Blair Institute did a piece of research on the um, on the 2023 Sunak budget. So when Sunak was still the Chancellor, and 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 he and he sort of made the calculation that 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 the that the tax rises inside that 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 budget were 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 were, were pretty much effectively directly the same as the costs of Brexit to that point have been. I'm not expressing that very well because I can't remember, uh, remember it, but a, a quick a quick Google would 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 find that report. Because the the what you're saying is the costs of Brexit to the economy were the same in magnitude as and, the and, 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 left that, and left that kind of that kind of that fiscal hole in what the government's plans otherwise right. would have been. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Something okay. like that. But to say if it, it, the, the, those if Ian TBI Sunak Budget twenty three, if you were to search that you'd probably find that report. Right. I mean that was really a way of trying to put a give people an idea because you don't live the counterfactual. You don't yeah. you know the 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 four percent of GDP the economy would have otherwise been, of course, you know, you, no one ever lived in the world where the economy was that much bigger, and so it's a way of, you know, trying to quantify or, or you know, the, to make the fact that these kind of rather subterranean impacts do actually have an impact. You know, people would be better off, households would be richer, investment would be higher, um, if you know, if we lived in doppelganger britain yeah. of course we don't yeah. and so no. and there are other bigger contributory factors like the pandemic like the war in ukraine energy energy shock you know it isn't all about brexit it really isn't all about brexit. Mm -hmm. not for business not for the economy thanks let's have our next question this comes from simon lord how likely is it that the UK will have to adopt the euro in order to rejoin the EU? I see they've said all panel members, so perhaps I'll have a bash at this one as well. Let's start with, I'm going to start with you, Chris, because this is a purely speculative question, so yeah. we can all speculate. Well, I, 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 I think two things about it. One is just, one is that I, 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 I think that at this point it just it just seems actually just like a kind of a, a bit of a pointless specul speculation because no, no one can actually answer that you know you could you, you know you, you just you just you, it's just literally is 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 is, uh, is unanswerable and so you might say that but but at the same time I think that certainly for a campaigning organization that wants to rejoin the EU um, I think that it's kind of problematic to be carrying with it the implication of sort of, well, um, we might like to rejoin the EU, but only if we don't have to be proper members. Yeah. Now it may be that what that what Peter just said that the, the British people would never would never accept the Euro. I, I'm personally not convinced about that. I mean, you, you know, because again, it depends on what timescales we're talking and what and what the circumstances are. But 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 whether or not that is the case, it seems to me that 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 to start from the beginning in terms of um, well, what might the, be the likely opt-outs that we might be able to secure from being a, from being a full EU member is 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 really not a very uh, helpful and certainly not a very kind of appealing from a sort of an EU uh, uh, from an EU uh, perspective, and I think that um, you know it's true that. Britain joined the EEC at the time, you know, perhaps largely for economic reasons in terms of this idea of being the sort of sick man of Europe. Um, although I think there was a, a there, there was also from some, particularly from the kind of wartime generation of politicians, a genuine commitment from some to the to, to the European budget. But anyway, be that as it may, I think the idea that we would that if we if we do join or rejoin join the EU, it is simply because of well. Uh, it has been so economically awful and damaging outside that we want to be back in again. It seems to me that that will just set us off again on exactly the same, potentially exactly the same trajectory as the one we entered on to, into before and uh, with the same kinds of results. And I, I quite often tell this story when I, 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 I give talks about or do, do, do events about Brexit. And I think of my father who voted, uh, you know, 
to, 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 to remain in the EEC in the 1975 election, and then became virulently anti-Brexit, uh, sorry, anti-EU membership. Um, he was dead before the time of the referendum, but he certainly would have voted uh, to leave. And the reason I think for that is that fundamentally, what the, what people like him felt, and he was a, you know, very much kind of you know, working class uh, voter, what he felt is, is, well, we had to join because we didn't really have any choice. And so right from the beginning, the very fact of membership was like, he voted for it and he thought it was necessary, but at the same time, it was a humiliation, right? And I think that if we were to recreate some form of, of, of UK membership of the EU on a similar kind of basis, oh, we found the world too, you know, too, 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 too hard out there on their own, our own and we've got to get, kind of get back in. I don't think this is very, very, very positive. Now, maybe that seems if we've come quite a long way from the question, but I think it kind of relates to it because it somehow seems to be like kind of saying, you know, oh, well, will there be, you know, Euro? Will there be Schengen? Will there be this? Will there be that? And it's like, it's like, it's like already before you've even got anywhere near making the decision, you're having a discussion about what opt outs will be possible. I mean, you know, imagine how that sounds if you were, you know, if, if, you're, listen if you're listening from the, e if, from the EU as an EU decision maker, how do you think that sounds? Mm. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd agree with that, Molly. I, I would. Just briefly, I think, um, point of fact, if you're going to rejoin, Master Treaty says if you meet the cri 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 convergence criteria, you've got to join the euro. Um, you know, you could have a Sweden situation where they keep the corona and they're basically allowed to. So we could go into the EU, join in the EU and never quite actually join the euro. Um, I... I I just feel, I, I mean, I agree with Chris profoundly that, um, you know, the EU have just lived through a decade of pretty bitter exchanges with us. And before that, you know, another two decades of recalcitrant UK, they're not interested in having another massive renegotiation. You know, I think the only conceivable way in which the UK goes back in is if in this changing world in which we're living in, it makes absolutely obvious sense to everybody that we'd better off, you know, an overwhelming. And I realise that we went out on a 52-48 vote, but I don't think you even start the conversation with the EU until such time as it's, you know, pretty much a fait accompli. You know, it's obvious to all sides. That's where the public is. That's where we need to be. And so, you know, I don't see a marginal campaign really being ever part of the equation because I don't think either the two political parties would see upside in that campaign and I don't think the EU want us back on a 52-48 margin they've got other things to worry about um, yeah. Yeah. so you know I think that I, I, I think Chris's framing is, is profoundly sage <laughs> thank you thank you it's nice to have a sage or two why is it um, <laughs> I'm going to throw in my, my two pennies since I think that the questioner was asking for that. And I have to start by admitting I was part of the No Euro campaign where I work with George Eustace. That feels like a very long time ago now. And I was indeed an anti-European in those days, but I'm I'm a convert. I hope uh, there's more rejoicing over this lost sheep than over all the people that were right in the first place. But I, I in terms of the practicalities, I agree with what you said about Sweden, Peter. But I, I think the reason I opposed um, joining the single currency is for me, this is really the, the nub of the sovereignty question, the fact that you are free to, to organise your public spending without having to apply for permission to Germany. And I would find that pretty intolerable and pretty hard to swallow, and particularly given the way the euro is currently organised in a, in a pretty undemocratic way, to be honest. So that I find all quite unpalatable. But coming back to... Chris's point, I do think it would be part of our pledge to be good Europeans if we did that. And I think even I would be able to swallow it, but I'm, I'm not sure I'm in the right sort of enthusiastic mode for rejoining Euro and all that Chris was suggesting we need to be. But the, 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 the big problem, you know, with, with the Euro was and continues to be, uh, and I would say this was partly because of British membership of the European Union. It was it was it was the fact that 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 the 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 political implication of a common currency is a common fiscal policy it is in fact a common polity it was the yeah. sovereigntists 
refusal to accept that that was, that was what led to this, what I agree is a kind of unsatisfactory situation of, of, of currency integration with insufficient political integration. Exactly. And, and once you do that properly, then you do actually get over the sovereignty question because, because we don't have endless debates about, you know, has Northamptonshire lost sovereignty compared with Leicestershire? Compared with Leicestershire? You know, the issue is what is the shared policy that they belong to? So that question about, you know, about a, demo, a, fully, a fully democratically constituted European state, that seems to be, you know, another and kind of, a kind of important, uh, important question. But British Euro skeptics, as we used to call them, you know, spent decades, you know, d absolutely, you know, resisting in every respect any notion of 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 of, of a, you know, a, 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 a European state. Yeah, because I ultimately, this... I mean, it's it's debt transfers, right? I mean, we do yeah. sometimes. You know, English nationalists will bitch sometimes about the extra money that gets sent to Scotland in their view. Actually, but actually, surprisingly little if you look at, you know. But we do. ultimately, rich Northern Europe doesn't want to pick up the bill as they would see it for poorer Southern Europe. Even though, you know, whilst the Germans were berating the Greeks in the in the fiscal crisis of 2015, they were of course very happy to sell Daimler buses to the Greek economy that was essentially inflated by the hot money flows that were created by having a single unit of currency for one unit of economic activity in Germany as they did in Greece when they were clearly not equal, right? So you got the money transfers that led to the debt crisis that the Greeks ultimately faced. And, and it's never been addressed. And even now, you know, I mean, you could argue that, well, not you could argue, I think the COVID crisis has incrementally moved the debt transfer issue forward. But whenever that issue came up, the Brits were absolutely adamant that they wouldn't be part of picking up the bill for keeping yeah. the euro together. I, I think this this does take us back to the earlier point that we wouldn't be joining the same EU that we left. And I mean, you're right, it was just an incremental change due to the COVID spending, Peter. But I, I'm, I have to be hopeful that there will be changes to the way the the fiscal stability pact is organized and so on so that joining the euro might be less unpalatable perhaps i can be optimistic about that um okay next question please so this is from sarah cowley and she asks can labor be prized away from its current hard brexit stance can the lib dems be encouraged to speak up about brexit and i'm going to throw in my version of this question which we didn't reach earlier which is is it too soon to bring the question of rejoin into the mainstream political discussion? And or do you just think politicians are being cowardly, which is a sort of slightly more hostile framing of the question that Sarah asked? What do you think, Peter? I believe that question was before the election. Um, and if it, the answer to that question is no and no, both for the Lib Dems and Labour, um, I think it's very clear you know, there are two arguments going on in the Labour Party um, and actually similarly in the Lib Dems. The first argument is if you bring clarity, then you kill the debate. So by being outside the single market and the customs union, Starmer's trying to head off the Brexit betrayal narrative from the Tories. And the kind of European movement inside the Labour Party, the Stella Creasy argument is, look, if you're clear about what you are prepared to do, which is short of rejoining, short of single market membership, that just should neuter the debate, but it also opens up space to get a serious answer to what you'd actually do. I think the trouble is the Labour Party has decided at the highest level that really opening the Pandora's box of Brexit is fundamentally a, uh, 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 a, no, a no win scenario because those people who are pro EU and pro Remain, etc., are going to vote Labour anyway. And where they are trying to reclaim the votes that, as Boris Johnson said, were lent to the Tories in the Red Wall, um, a quibble over Brexit is neither here nor there. I would say there's a bigger issue, though, too, which is that political parties are right to not to raise something for which they don't have good answers, right? If you're going to say, we're going to fix Brexit, Right. Well, the next question is, how are you going to do it? And if you've already said you're outside the single market and the customs union, the answer is 
you don't really substantively have a plan to actually fix the economic consequences of Brexit, to actually make it more likely that a car factory is built, built in this or that constituency. And so one of the reasons why they don't want to talk about it is that actually, once you start talking about how you really might start to fix Brexit, you get into a whole load of questions about giving money to the European Union, paying to join Erasmus, putting in more than you get out, um, dynamically aligning with EU rules, going back to taking rule taking from Brussels, etc., all of which remain fairly politically toxic and don't, you know, because the, the next logic to those questions is, well, if you're going to do all that rule taking and paying in the budget, why don't you just rejoin? And then you've said, well, I'm not joining the single market and the customs union. Round and round we go. And so for those reasons, no and no. I can't remember the question. I put the question back, Scott. Coming, coming <laughs> to you then, Chris. And can Labour be prized away from its current line on Europe? And can right, the Lib Dems will too? Will the Lib Dems, yeah. Um, I think I, I, I completely agree with that, but maybe, maybe this is just saying the same thing in a different way. But it seems to me that you know one fundamental problem here is that if Labour, and we can go back to Lib Dems because maybe they're done because a little bit different for them, but if Labour were to propose as their policy, because I think the question was, can they move away from hard Brexit? So I, I, that to me, that it means saying they would have to put forward a policy which at the least was to seek to, 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 to join the single market, maybe to make a customs treaty. I mean, that's a, a different discussion, perhaps, um, or, or, or to join the EU. But but apart, I mean, there are many issues here. The, the most obvious one is that as soon as they do that, that is going to make the whole le legislation about Brexit. And uh, despite, I, I don't think I've said this before, but I might have done because I do quite a lot of these talks. But you know, despite this recent kind of Curtis John, John discussion, John Curtis and his discussion of polling saying, "Oh well, that people who who are going, who are, who are supporting or going to vote Labour, that that wouldn't bother them, that Labour could have a more pro EU stance without losing their support." But it completely ignores what it would do to the Tory vote, which is that it would enable them to rally behind a save Brexit thing and the whole split, which is which is so difficult for them between reform and the uh, Conservatives, that would basically disappear. Uh, Farage or Tice or whoever it might be can say again, as they did at the 2019 election, well, we're going to stand on our candidates because defending Brexit is the most important kind of thing. So there's that electoral thing. But the bigger problem, I think, is that how could Labour, a Labour government, deliver that policy? How could they deliver a policy that was that, 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 that said that we were going to join the single market or the EU in the next parliament, which is what they would, would be talking about. Now, it seems to me that there, there would have to be a referendum. And I, personally, I, I, although I know some disagree about this, but I don't think you, that we could join the single market without a referendum. So you've got to be, you've got to have that. But also, I don't think there's a cat in hell's chance of the EU or EFTA or anybody else ever accepting any idea of rejoining unless there is cross-party consensus. In other words, unless, the, unless, the, unless it's clear that the Tories are not going to reverse this at the next election. Um, and, um, and so if you make as your flagship policy something which you probably can't even deliver, then it seems to me that you're just on a hiding to nothing politically. Now, then you might say, oh, well, but couldn't they say, um, well, in the long term, this is our policy. Um, and the problem with that is that if you say that and sort of say, you're basically saying, well, our current policy of TCA review isn't really kind of viable, uh, and then say, but actually, we're not going to pursue the more viable policy. Go, so, well, why? Why aren't you going to do that? Now, I would argue that they could, again, it's a matter of honesty, that they could say a sort of version of what I've just said in terms, which would be to say, we do think that it would be better economically and many other ways, it would be better to join the single market, it would be better to join the EU. But we do not think that this is possible unless there is consensus across the main parties for this to be the case. And therefore, um, we are not, we don't advocate this policy, and that is down to the Tories, which will put the, 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 the responsibility where it lay, and we'll have the benefit of being honest. honest. Now, but I said earlier, I'm an analyst and not a campaigner, and I, I, a, a very senior uh, ex Labour cabinet minister, I won't name. When I, I discussed this with him, and said that, and says, said, "This is a very clever idea, Chris, but it's much too clever for practical politics." And so that, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and, and that may be true. But I have come to think 
you know, despite feeling quite frustrated with Labour's stance on this, that actually that 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 that, 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 that really there is no real sort of alternative for them. The issue then becomes, I think, talking in a more uh, for a lot more clarity about what they think they can do in relation to the TCA, uh, uh, and not just the TCA, but other aspects of that. The Lib Dems, yes, I mean, I think it's a similar story for them. That potentially, I was thinking this the other day, this might kind of change, which is that if the current attempt to get Ed Davey status to stand down because of all the post office thing and all this kind of thing, and you were to have a new Lib Dem leader and a new Lib Dem policy that became very pro-EU, that would make life a lot more difficult for Labour because the thing that Peter just said about, about you know, well, basically the Labour are going to hold on to their remainers, maybe they might not if the Lib Dems had, had, had a different policy. And so that would sort of, that would pose a new kind of challenge for Labour. But that's obviously very speculative. Thank you both. Thank you. I mean, I think it's fairly clear that things are crystallised until the election, but they might get quite interesting fairly soon after the election, particularly in view of what might happen to the Conservative Party. But I guess that's the sort of thing that the European movement needs to be prepared to react to with, with both the main parties. OK, so next question. Robin Charleston, for the experts, should re-entry into the EU be preceded and sanctioned by a referendum? I was coming back to your point, Chris. Or has the concept become so odious that it should be left strictly alone? I mean, I, I yeah, both. do, do the answer that is both. have a place in our constitution, perhaps we could ask as well. I think the answer to that is both, that, 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 that it has been, the notion of a referendum has become so odious, it's difficult to imagine any British government ever having a referendum about anything again, ever. But at the same time, I don't think there's any, you know, I don't see any, 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 any realistic way that you could do it without you know, with, with that referendum. And again, it comes back to my issue about kind of cross-party consensus, that maybe conceivably you could, if there was sort of like 70% of the support for it in the opinion polls, and if every political party was sort of saying that. But if you say no referendum, and this, this is, by the way, the same, I think, why I think there has to be one for, would have to be one for single market, then you're effectively saying, okay, whenever there is a majority in parliament for joining or leaving, we just join or leave. That is not a realistic proposition for the European Union. No, I don't, yeah. I mean, I, it's a yes and yes is the answer to that question. Um, oh, I think so. uh, yes and yes. No, no, uh, no. Yes and no. No and no, but yes and yes. And, and, and actually, it will be non contentious because, as Chris rightly says, the eventuality won't arise until such time as it's blindingly obvious that the, the country is overwhelmingly ready to rejoin. And then there will be a referendum and it will be you know, a, I imagine, you know, two thirds majority, which is what the last one should have be, constitutional change, etc. And if it doesn't cross the threshold, because we, we all know 4258, sorry, 5248 is a, is a nonsense. We've all been through too much for that. So yeah, is the answer to that 65%, 67%, two thirds, whatever. I like and I think all those simple majorities in each of the constituent nations as well. Yeah, I, I think it's taking us back to your earlier point, which is we wouldn't be taken seriously in negotiations until we've had a pretty overwhelming and settled majority. And once we reach that stage, the referendum will be a sort of foregone conclusion. But but I I should say because it's particularly just to keep speaking to a campaign group that certainly I don't know about Peter, but certainly I don't mean by that the people who want to join or rejoin therefore should just say, oh, well, we're just going to sit sit back and wait for, for, for it to happen. I mean, it, is, it, it, it isn't, the country won't get to the point of just thinking, oh yeah, we want to rejoin without a campaign. It's not an argument not to go on campaigning. No, no it's, it's our job to build that strong. You know, that is a necessary kind of condition of that. Yeah. And obviously also, you know, demography may well have an impact or should, well, is likely to have an impact it's as having well. an impact um, yeah no our I job mean, is to build that strong and persistent majority so yeah, that yeah. it becomes an inevitability yeah okay next question probably the last one i think scott hello scott nice to see you here do we need to sort out a british or english parliament constitution first before we even consider joining the eu oh challenging question what do you think chris <laughs> don't know don't know are you a fan of a written constitution? I mean, I, I, I have actually... I, 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 I kind of used to be, but I, I, I became quite yeah. kind of influenced by, 
Um, I like the writing of David Allen Green a lot, and, and I've been quite struck by his, you know, his, his kind of arguments against, you know, against against. I, 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 you know, I just don't know. And and in a way, you know, having sort of spent the last unexpectedly, because I never expected to get involved, having spent the last seven years kind of castigating idiotic Brexiters for spouting about crap they don't know anything about. I think maybe by the same token, I don't particularly want to spout crap about the things <laughs> I don't know anything about. So perhaps we'll have a constitutional session and we'll bring this question back. Peter, did you have any thoughts on this one? No, I, I it, no is the answer, because I just think it begs a huge question about reforming the House of Lords, about the monarchy, about, you know, there's so much under that bonnet before you get to rejoining the EU that is really much more about us than it is about them. And I don't think, I don't think, if, you know, from a EU perspective, that is a requirement in any way, you know, you know, I, I don't, so in that sense, and I, and I, I don't, yeah, I think, I think it's, I, I think that's a sort of slightly tangential question. To the, to I can tell you when, about... when I was sitting in the European Parliament through all those interminable parliamentary debates, people would often say to me, oh, but can they do that? And I would sort of have to respond, well, if they can get away with it, you know, and people were pretty scandalised, I can tell you, people who are used to having a proper constitution. Which, yes. You know, can they dissolve Parliament? Well, we'll see if they get hauled off on that <laughs> one or not. You know. I know, but we, <laughs> yes, but yeah. I mean, that is just an odd function of the way in which... The UK managed its managed its way out of absolute monarchy, right? So, but it, I, you know, if if it was the Germans telling us what to do about our constitution, I'd be listening anyway. Maybe not on other things, but on that one, I would take their constitution mm. tomorrow. Oh, I'm just saying too many controversial things. I shall take their me. electoral system as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, we've got time for one other quick question, if you can snap one up on the screen right now. Thank you. Karen asks, do you think more work needs to be done to convince people that their votes for European government do make a difference? Ah, is reform of that organisation needed first? That's an interesting question. I mean, I, perhaps we could ask that in terms of the European elections and whether you think we're going to hear much about those. I've heard some interesting reports, you know, that, that when they say this is the most democratic year ever or, you know, more people getting to vote this year, they include the European elections, which seems slightly counter to what was being discussed at the time when we were being told it wasn't a, a democratic organisation. Any reflections on, on Europe as a democratic organisation? I mean, I think in the, I mean, the context of the discussion that we've been having about joining or rejoining, um, you know, it, it does go back to the kind of the thing about, you know, what will the EU look like in the future? And, and I mean, this isn't directly to do with what's been spoken about, but I mean, it does seem to me that one thing which we haven't said is that, is that, is that the, um, the possibility of, you know, a sort of multi-speed Europe, which I mean, I know is a sort of, you know, hacked the old thing, which has been you know around for around for decades, but did seem to get new impetus from Macron, and um, and and I think that in the context of potential enlargements, one could sort of see that as being a more so. so this isn't actually about I'm more talking about about governance per se than any yeah. particular kind of institution, um, but that it does seem to me that um, there is a certain kind of there has always been a certain kind of uh, logic as the EU has expanded towards, you know, something like that on a more stable kind of a basis. And then I think the question about, about what within a sort of multi-tiered kind of Europe, what the difference, different governance arrangements were for the different tiers, and I suppose there's an implicit assumption there that the UK would be a, you know, is likely to be a more outer tier if that were to sort of emerge. You know, that then does seem to me to become uh, become a really, a really important question. And it's right, you know, that when we voted in 2016, how many people had anything, any idea at all about how the institutions of the EU worked? But I mean, I have always felt about that, that was true, that how many people had any idea about, or have any idea about how the institutions uh, some of which are extremely obscure of the UK constitution work, right? Yeah, I think, it, you you know, we need lessons in European civics as much as EU civics. You remember Macron when he came in, you remember we were all going to be going to go around Europe and there were going to be great jamborees to celebrate 
being European and all over the continent, people are going to be meeting to celebrate. You know, I, I, I think the truth is that Europeans are conflicted on Europe, which is to say, on one level, when you go to Italy, we go to northern Italy, when I was covering Europe for the Telegraph, Lots of Italians would go, you're so lucky we, you didn't join the Euro. If we hadn't, weren't trapped in the Euro, we'd be joining, we'd be joining you too with, with Brexit, Italy exit. But by the same token, Italians know that the European kind of guardrails keep some of their politicians and politics from being crazier than they otherwise would be. So people understand that the European system gives them stability even though they do differentiate between european democracy and and that sense that it's important to be part of europe so the euro barometer did some polls recently about the four concentric circles that chris uh, 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 recalled this new franco-german paper about a super integrated core the current eurozone associate memberships and then the kind of epc the european political community on the outside French and Italian voters were had the split the same way as UK voters did about which circle they wanted to be in, which gives you an idea of how much um, uh, antipathy is the wrong word, how much uh, um, uncertainty there is about European public's relationship to Europe um, yeah. as a as a. Uh, um, as a kind of democratic um, entity. Yeah. But, you know, you do one very quick thing, which is, well, I won't say anything else, but it's just that but before any of this becomes any relevant in any kind of way of, you know, joining, rejoining different tiers, any of these kinds of things, the one thing which, which is the necessary prior condition of this, and which I, I think is the thing that people in the European movement can share with, for example, the very cautious, if you like, sort of what Labour government looks, looks like being is that the very first step to all of this is a normalization of relationship of sort of something you know just a kind of a a a a, a, a stability that 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 a stability in the relation and uh, the tone and the content of the relation you know that that at least you know so so, so so we can sort of whatever the future is that the kind of era of Brexit is you know gradually fades to being just you know, something in the past. And, and I think whatever Starmer what does, whatever Starmer does, um, he will embark on that, making the UK being back part of the neighbourhood. And the stuff you can do to do that, a youth mobility deal would be important. Actually combining on net zero and energy transfers, you know, as a joint thing, security, given the Ukraine situation, that, you know, before you get into the whole single market, fixing trade and all the rest of it, there are two or three, four really big things you can do to just fundamentally rewrite the conversation, draw a line under the adversarialism and the zero sum approach that's come before and, and show in concrete terms that you actually want to be part of the polity, part of the wider European neighbourhood, part of the strategic thinking and security. In Europe. And then you start to open a different conversation about the fact that actually you know, in the car industry, we want, um, you know, we have a mutual strategic interest. And we saw this grudgingly with the French, with the European EV tariffs debate that went on prior to in December, you know, that actually, you know, we all need to be part of the same thing and that we're, we're you know, we're, but we're weaker apart. Um, uh, but, you know, that starts with saying, actually, we want to be part of the neighbourhood. We want to be part of, you know, uh, of, of the wider polity that is Europe rather than European Union in the first instance and then let's see where that gets us. Okay yeah great fantastic well we've got to the end of our time it's gone very quickly because there's been some fascinating conversations thank you again very hearty thank you to, to Peter and to Chris for joining us we really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us and I think we've gleaned some really important insights in terms of our own campaigning work. I know for many of us, we just want to join the EU tomorrow, but I think it's salutary to listen to experts telling us about what the timescales look like and what the pathway to EU membership might be like and how we might progress along it. So so thank you for sharing your, your thoughts about that, Peter and Chris.
And I think what I've taken away in particular is this idea that we, and this is a job for us as the European Union, we need to encourage British people to see the European Union as a peace project, as a democratic project, rather than just a sort of transactional relationship. And I think we knew that already, but that is where a lot of our work is focused, but it's really underlined for me tonight the important role the European movement has to play in, in making that a reality in the UK. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you for your questions. I hope you found it as interesting this evening as I have, and we look forward to welcoming you back to a future event. Thank you very much and good evening.